Okay. Um, nobody has turned up to our first collaborative session. And in a sense, I'm very happy about it because I prefer that you work actually on your own or using LearnLine. There is plenty of resources on our LearnLine site. I want you to look uh, through them. <coughs> now, I don't want you to actually underestimate the assignment um, task. It's very easy to do so, especially since many of you have a pretty good experience in schools. I can assure you that through this unit, you will learn things I think you have never seen or never heard before of. They will be still covered uh, under the, uh, they will be still including the kinds of concerns that curriculum talks about and also the readings in TESOL. Uh, however, uh, curriculum itself in Australia doesn't tell you exactly what, what strategies to use in order to have these <clears throat> particular outcomes integrated in your teaching. And TESOL literature has been very uh, incessant and um, largely driven by linguists who obviously, as the name says it all, are not teachers. Or they, like, they, they linguists turned into teachers, which is not actually the same as pedagogues, because pedagogues require particular training, and uh, especially training in the philosophy of uh, the kind of uh, ontology and epistemology that underpins our ways of viewing people and action, right? There's no such a thing like a pure viewing of who your students are and what is it that we actually want them to do. Anybody who thinks that we are just asking them questions or they are just students is completely wrong and you would have to admit it. If the world was as simple as this, we would have had now computers not only just doing what they do, but we would have robots around the house listening to our commands, doing as we tell them, or even actually engaging in research. Why don't we have it? Because the, um, the technology people, the engineers, have encountered the problem that, that Significant for people involved in meaning making studies have always said that the meaning of the text is not in the text. There are as many meanings of the same text as there are people sitting in a particular room or reading it. The world is a very complicated place and reality is not obvious. So, with the TESOL um, discipline of the TESOL field, acting as the reality was obvious to students were students and all we have to do is to chunk up the information that they have to inquire according to our own theory. Instantly a person like this which should actually encounter the question which is what makes your way of chunking the right way of chunking? Well, as you will see, the TESOL people don't really ask this question. And when they ask this question, they say, well, because I use universal grammar or because I've got a teacher's vision. I've got a teacher's eye. It's like a god's eye. It's like a mother's heart, knows it all. In poetry, but not in real life. So what happens, they produce all these justifications. Or we look at the student from a perspective of a universal grammar that might be true. The point is, the student is not the carrier of a universal grammar. It's just an assumption. So, and the same when it comes to experience as a teacher. The way you see a teacher, whether you see with the experienced eye of a pedagogue or experienced heart of a mother, depends um, which, which perspective you choose to justify the way you chunk your syllabus. The point is, it's still your perspective. It's not a student's perspective. And we're hit hitting exactly straight away the problem of inclusion. We're all inclusive. We're all engaging students. We're all wonderful teachers. But when hard questions are being asked, we are hard. We find it very hard and tough to find an answer that actually, even to us, sounds reasonable. It's not the answer that we give to people. It's the answer that we ourselves, down deep in our heart, actually would agree with. 
so this is this is just to this little introduction I'm producing. This is just to make you aware that this unit is not as simple as it seems, and you'll encounter here questions from me that are not as simple as um, the, the traditional literature of Tesla thinks they should be. So the question which drives all my research and all my teaching is, how do you know that what you do is an answer to the questions that students currently have on their mind? In other words, how do you do that what you do is not violating a student's space? It's not actually replacing students' questions with your own. And when you do so, if you do reply students' questions with your own, you force them to memorize answers. And as a result, in a sense, we could say we train them. And they will be acting out those answers for us for the duration of the particular assessment task, but not afterwards. But it's all right. Pay their bills. It could be true. But it is not the objective of this unit. The objective of this unit is not to ensure that uh, you get on with, this, with the teaching. The objective of this unit is that you can actually stay employed until you're 50, 60, and maybe 70 if you wish so. The longevity of your job depends on longevity of your eyesight, of your vision. The more myopic you are, the less chance you have to feel integrated in the future. Because at the end of the day, um, the world is not an, as a mean a place as sometimes media or whoever tries to uh, project. There are good people everywhere, there are great mothers everywhere, and everybody wants their children to be put in a school with a teacher who actually is progressive. And the curriculum, as much as people actually talk badly about the curriculum, in fact, I think the way they read reflects how they see. It's not necessarily what they see, it's how they see. There are great statements in the curricula, um, great statements uh, in regard to objectives of language learning, objectives of actually self-awareness of students and well-being and resilience. There is great stuff there. It is now a matter of finding a person who is able to actually integrate all of these outcomes in a way that works for the student and works for the school and works for the parents and works for everybody, and that's an art. And I, I hate to see myself say, say that, but it's an art because it's not because intu it's intuition based. It's taking the teaching from just the job making thing to an intellectual endeavor. And because it's a master course, it's, an, it's a professional upgrading or upskilling course, I want to challenge you with it, which is how do you ensure that your activities in classrooms are actually facilitating? equal participation for everyone in the class? How do you ensure that the task or the questions you so innocently might be, or teachers so innocently set up for students, in fact, they do nothing else but replace student questions, student engagement, student drives with those pedagogical tasks that the students go through them in order to get a mark. Obviously, no real learning happens. What happens is just a little um, teacher-pleasing uh, activity. So these are the things, the questions that basically summarize concerns such as accounting for differences, learner-centeredness, or inclusion. All of them are about the same. How do you make sure that the, that the student feels present in the class as opposed to wiped out? There are strategies that teachers tell me they use in um, ESL context. I read them. I did a lot of those strategies, especially when my students don't engage with learning materials. So sometimes when I have an evil moment, I actually teach my students, especially on campus, with the strategies that they, they say to me they will be using in classroom. And it's very interesting how an interest, how a uh, innocent strategy of, well, I'll come to the classroom and we'll have a discussion. Brainstorming, that's even better. 
storming of the brain. Doesn't really sound peaceful, but yeah, we will we'll have a discussion. Discussion is good. People can talk. Who talks? Who talks? So in order just to test it on my students with a inclusive and wonderful and gentle and beautiful, engaging uh, activity discussion is I come to the classroom and I ask them a question. I want to actually discuss with them, for example, why the module in the literacy unit starts with the topic reader. And what do I get? Do you think that I get a storming, brainstorming discussion with people tripping over themselves in order to just put something on the whiteboard? If they could, they would put their noses under the desk, basically acting out as if they were begging me, please don't ask me. So I asked them, what's wrong with our discussion? We have a, you know, they, can't, they were supposed to come, I mean, other than, differently than your students in class, they actually are supposed to come to the lecture prepared. People in Harvard do. And I wonder whether people in Harvard come to the lecture because, prepared because they pay more money? I don't know. Anyway, they were supposed to come prepared. I don't use any question other than what's there on the learn line. The first module is called Reader. I'm asking them why. And everybody wants to leave the class. And I say to them, why? Because it's not the question on your mind at this very moment, because my strategy is not inclusive. What is it? I'm just trying to do the thing you do to your children in class. And you're 20, 30, they are only five or six or seven. Why do you see that discussion so disengaging? So as you can see, nothing is as simple as we think it is. And a lot of those, a lot of those seemingly innocent strategies are not innocent. We actually start, the, there's a saying that the truth is what we say is truth. So the more you say a particular thing, the more you start believing it. So for example, the more we believe the discussion is good, the more we actually believe that the discussion is good. So we keep telling each other, in the time, oh, I'm tired with the discussion. I make room for students to talk. How do you make room for students to talk? How? Two students might be talking, the rest is quiet. How do you ensure that if you want your, your important discussion, because you believe in discussion, and I'm not saying the discussions are wrong, I'm just saying there's a place and time for it. Not necessarily the first thing you actually do when you appear in the classroom. They all want to leave. I don't know, haven't, haven't my pre-service teachers been students themselves? Most of my classroom mates, other than me, because I was hyperactive, I probably would have been on drugs back then, had we had those drugs back then. As soon as the teacher opened their mouth, my, my friends just wanted to leave. And they would all look at me, come up on you with something, do something, save us. That was a popular girl, not because I was so uh, popular, it's just because the teacher was making me popular. The teacher terrified students or children, they looked at me, I gave them the answer, and all was well, and they all loved me. So I had a good time in school. So you can see, th th there's a reason why I'm saying to you, please do not take any of the activities in this assignment lightly. Do not think that you understand the readings just because you read them before, like for example, the Tessel readings. I would want you to actually start reading, if you do read any Tessel readings, like, like Richards and Rogers or any of those uh, cornerstones, seemingly you know, cornerstones reading in Tessel, I would really like you to put some teeth and do some hacking. Hacking, hacking doesn't mean just hacking the internet, it means hacking into information and actually chipping off some bits from it and actually getting some sort of critical insight into it. Right, so don't say, don't run through the word. They say include the learner centered and wonderful preparatory and authentic and all these words. It's like fashion. You can dress up the most horrific woman with lovely, in lovely clothes and make her look like a star. Right, we, we, we create those words and, and those stories around people. 
and their own directions and what we do. I mean, go to any school, they all are engaged full and uh, they have this wonderful uh, inclusive strategies and all of that. Just ask us all. But if you start poking a little bit and trying to find out why they think that, you'll find out that there is no foundation for it. It's just words. Words, and they're not actually the words that link anything. They're just words that link nothing. So, um, <clears throat> a lot of materials in this unit, and especially the ones that I actually created or uh, posted there, as opposed to this big long file which was produced by someone else in the past just to give students an overview of what happens in textual literature. I didn't do that, someone else did it before me, and I don't delete it because I love resources. I believe in resource-based learning. Um, that's why we love the internet. It's got everything on it, right? It's got everything. You don't have to use everything, but it's got everything. Well, it doesn't have everything, but it has a lot. So, the stuff relevant to language teaching and actually doesn't have, despite of the wealth of materials for language teaching, it actually doesn't have the quality materials, materials, because in order for quality materials to be there, we need quality approach, and quality approach is very hard to find. Now, um, so in regard to assignment one, I just wanted to actually let you know how it works, because it is often misunderstood. The reason why we actually wanted most of our students to move to MEDI and not stay in MAD is because a lot of times those MED units are constructed like undergraduate courses. And as a result, students are not likely to get the kind of um, breadth of uh, vision required to actually understand issues. So um, that was actually the main reason for it. Um, so this unit could have been treated like basically create your unit of work first briefly, then sort of in the PowerPoint with examples of resources and create a story with 3,000 words and just go home. Could have been if I wasn't here, but I'm just not going to let it happen because that's not where the future is. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the way I think of assignment one, and I'll just let you know as soon as I have, I'm actually off, off, off work today and sick. I got food poison after this. Um, we had this power outage in Darwin. Uh, then they told us not to eat the food which was in the fridge, so I didn't. I went out, and because I went out, I got food poisoned. The people in the restaurant where I ate actually didn't actually take enough precautions. So I'm a bit shaky today. Okay, <clears throat> what I want you to do with assignment one, I want you to do with assignment one everything that. <clears throat> you would not do if you were an undergraduate student. And it means a number of things. First of all, a critical approach. I want you to actually, when you prepare for assignment one, not to just read the stuff in module one, read all the stuff, play with videos, search, you know, do mixes and matches and do whatever you want <clears throat> to, uh, to find information. Now, assignment one is just a, <coughs> a sketch of the unit of work. It's not a wedding. Right? It's just a sketch. What I would like to happen as a result of us posting this assignment one on LearnLine and us commenting maybe on those uh, learn on those um, assignments and I would love I mean I can't do it. I don't think I'm allowed to do it, but it would be good to actually post some that you would look at each other's uh, sketches and actually make some comments. You have those comments and you have my comments. And what I want you to do as a result of those comments, make appropriate changes to that unit of work in assignment two. What my undergraduate students do, which amazed me, and because I don't have enough experience in teaching undergraduate students, I didn't predict it. But a couple of years ago, I was teaching a unit and <clears throat> the similar tasks they had to do. And it didn't matter whether they got a pass fail or whatever. Assignment two was just an expanded version of assignment one. I couldn't believe it. Whatever grade they got, 
made no difference to them. They never actually integrated the feedback to change. So those students, assignment one was a wedding. <clears throat> Here's the Ten Commandments. Here's my assignment with all the things I will have. <coughs> and um, and they will be there, no matter what you say, Anya. And I, it's very interesting because students love getting feedback. <clears throat> I don't know why, if they don't integrate it. So assignment one is basically for you a test. <clears throat> it is a test. You will get feedback from each other. You will get a feedback from me. <clears throat> and then I expect you to actually work on that feedback. Right? I expect you that you actually integrate the ideas of your friends and of mine and make assignment two and three shiny, bright, and wonderful, as opposed to still at the same level as you were thinking in week two or three when assignment one is due, or whenever assignment one is due, six, week six, I don't know. So there. Um, so that's about the assignments and about the kind of approach that I'm asking you to undertake. Um, you can see that I have posted a particular text uh, from my email. Well, I often, not often, but sometimes, because I'm a vice president of Asia Call, Asia Computer Assisted Language Learning Association, and I am vice president with the portfolio of innovation and research, I sometimes get emails from people this particular friend, actually, I met, I was a keynote address in Malaysia, <clears throat> and I met this beautiful woman from Indonesia, and now and then she writes to me. When she's in trouble, she writes to me. Well, this time she was in trouble. She didn't know how to teach listening. So I gave her this outrageous, this is a unit of work. All you have to do now is to take this unit of work and translate it into curricular outcomes and all the things that are needed. and find resources that will be of use to students in order to actually engage in it in a way that is actually from their perspective. That's what they have to do. So that's what the uh, now designer would have to do with these ideas. But basically I suggested a number of things and one of them things like create an X Factor show. Every kid loves singing. Doesn't matter what their age. They know the songs, they don't know the words. YouTube has all the words on the planet and more in every language because all the songs get translated in any case, but they will be in English to get, create a karaoke show. Also, if the karaoke show is going to be a production for the school, then also create advertisements because sometimes people need a break and advertisements, as we know, are entertainment, right? They're very funny sometimes. I mean, just the other day I saw the advertisement of pizza, uh, Domino Pizza. <clears throat> And it was very critical of Western culture in comparing what expectations we have as, as opposed to children, say, in some desert that can't even get clean water. <clears throat> anyway, uh, and it was actually making references to social networking as well. It was just a great ad. Now imagine how much information children will learn or students will learn by engaging in those kind of complex techniques. And I've seen great people do things like this with beginners. So even if you don't understand it, take, you know, take it on faith. We don't have to treat beginners or children in you know age five, six, seven years, eight years of age as if they just needed a word a day. That's just a total nonsense invented by someone in the 19th century. And that's what we often forget also. But those methods of language teaching, whatever they were, call them direct method and whatever, what era were they invented? When people barely had books, when people, there was no internet, there were no videos, there was no access, the world has changed. And if a student says to me, I'm going to use a bilingual method, all I want to do is shoot myself. That was 1950. That's when my mother was, I don't know living in conditions that you wouldn't even imagine that someone can live in, in a Western civilization, right? So just just do not make mistakes like this because they are plain mistakes. Not only that the lingual method per se is old and it's not valid itself, intellectually and conceptually, 
But to say to me, well, I'm going to dig up something that was written in 1950s and I'm going to apply to children in the 21st century. Look, we need to actually look at the job of the teacher in the following way. We actually do not have a choice here. We just don't have a choice. The field of language teaching is not a bucket. It's not a shopping basket where we just pick, we just throw in whatever we are. Today I'll do some direct method and tomorrow I'll do some um, language centered method uh, or something, whatever else they invented over the years. The reason why we're actually studying those methods is to actually for you to get a very quick overview of what not to do. Um, oh, hi, Pam. We've been going on now for half an hour. I'm just about finished. But nevertheless, Pam is online, so that's cool. So the reason why we're doing all these approaches is for you to actually learn what not to do, as opposed to say that these approaches are like uh, items on a, on a, in Woolworths on a, book, on a, on a, on a shelf. Uh, today I do um, 20 grams of, uh, by, of uh, audiolingual and tomorrow I'll have one kilogram of um, um, direct method, right? Direct method sounds cool. It does sound cool. And it was a cool thing in 1930s, a hundred years ago, when we didn't have all this stuff. So just to finish off today, and Pang will have to actually, uh, even though he is here, he will have to um, uh, access this uh, collaborate once it's finished and actually learn line processes it. And that's another thing we need to know, that what happens with these collaborate sessions, by the time we film them, what next thing what happens is they um, get processed by learn line. After they get processed by learn line, it just takes a while then you can already watch them. But what I will do, I will actually uh, convert them into a YouTube file and I will post them on YouTube and I will actually create a link to um, those files on our discussion board so they are easy to access. So nobody has to go through the gymnastics of accessing those uh, collaborate classes. Now, I really want you to watch these collaborate classes because um, they actually allow you to um, understand what the unit is about and how to work in this unit. It's, it's one thing to say I can do it all by myself by sitting somewhere in South Australia. This is not true and I have already explained why. So I will just ask Pang if he has any questions, but let me summarize what we've done today. I've given you the focus for your assessment. I ha and for the unit, the kinds of questions you need to consider um, when actually uh, attempting to answer assignment, assignment questions. I have warned you not to actually think that just because you are an experienced teacher you know how to teach. I wanted to tell you that you probably don't. Well, at least you don't have everything covered. That's why you need to do these master uh, upskilling cor uh, courses, right? We all do. Um, I continue every time I teach, even a unit like this, it's an opportunity for me to upskill myself as well. So I've done that. I have, uh, I can't remember what else I have done. And one of the things I've done, I have posted an email. So the top of the email is my writing. He has scroll YouTube, blah, blah, blah. Then that friend of mine has answered. And where the blue text starts, it was my reply to my friend's last response where I put some more things. Um, so basically, to summarize, when you start thinking about your ass assignment one, just go bravely, take risks, do not patronize children, do not think that you will do actual pedagogy of one word per day. It's a patronizing pedagogy and leads nowhere. Um, I would just stop here, see if Pam has any questions that I haven't covered. And uh, we'll close the lesson here. Bang, do you have any questions? Uh, no, not at the uh, moment. But okay, uh, well, I have, yeah, I have gone through the materials in the topic number one and week one, uh, and it's quite exciting from my point of view. 
Uh, actually, I have some backgrounds in the field of castles, and um, it, it's quite an adventure in that field. Um, it quite rocks my uh, my attention, um, truly. And hello. Yes, it is. It will be a it will be a challenging um, unit. I have to tell you because I have a critical perspective. I've got an educationist perspective on issues relevant to teaching teaching speakers to teaching English to speakers of other languages. So. I hope you have a great adventure. We're going to meet probably in two weeks' time and have another session. And until yes. then, I hope you can all watch this session and engage in the materials which are on LearnLine. Yes. I might close the session now. And Fang, if you have some more questions, we could talk about it. But I'll just close for now because I have said everything I wanted to say. Okay. No worries, then.